if you would be so kind as to bow your heads as we go before the Lord in prayer. We honor you and we bless your name, God. For you truly are a God that we can turn to in the time of trouble. We thank you, God, that we can hide behind you as you serve as a mountain. And that no matter what winds of life may blow our way, you're there to protect us and sustain us. We thank you, God, for how you have manifested yourself through this place today. We ask that you will continue to shower down your sweet Holy Spirit upon us. During now, this moment in which we have set aside to hear from you. And so God, I ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds. I ask God for a fresh revelation that we may go forth, God, and that there may be transformation within the lives of your people. God, I ask that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart will be acceptable in your sight. For there's no doubt, God, that you are our strength and you are our redeemer. And the people of God said, Amen, 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 amen. and amen. 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 Truly it is a good day to be in the house of the Lord one more time. For the Lord did not have to let us live, but he thought it not a robbery to touch us with his finger of love and allow us to be here today. I do want to thank God for my Father in the ministry, the Reverend Dr. Rodney D. Waller, for this chance to stand in the world. I do believe that there is a word from the Lord found in the book of Acts, the 20th chapter. Want to explore verses 7 through 12. Acts chapter 20, verses 7 through 12. When you have it, just signify it by standing to your feet if you're able to. If you're not, just go ahead and just say amen. 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 Acts chapter 20, beginning at verse Number seven, you will find these words both written and recorded from the New International Version. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people and because he intended to leave the next day, kept on talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where we were meeting. Seated in a window, was a young man named Eutychus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man, and put his arms around him. Don't be alarmed, he said. He's alive. Yeah. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate. After talking until daylight, he left. The people took the young man home alive and were greatly comforted. Yeah. For the time that is ours on today, First African, I would like to use for a thought title of this text with the topic, Don't Let Me Die This Way. <laughs> Don't Let Me Die this way. If I could have a subtopic, I would use there's yet still life. Yeah. Don't let me die this way, colon there's yet still life. And looking at verse 10 one more time, I like the way the message puts verse 10 when it says, Paul went down, stretched himself on him, and hugged him hard. No more crying, he said. There's life in him yet. Yes, sir. My brothers and sisters, I want to suggest today that in all of our lives, 
we have either encountered or are currently in the midst of situations that can be classified and categorized as dead situations. Dead situations and the fact that they are situations in which it appears that there's no real evidence of hope. Dead situations. Situations that leave us feeling as if our concentration should not be on that of continuing to move forward, let alone carrying on. Yeah, right. Dead situations. Situations that have us believing that our only options are to either create an exit plan of some sort, throw in the towel, or just plain and simply give up. For some of us, these dead situations exist within our very own homes. Yes, Flames that once burned bright in our marriages and within our relationships with our significant others have now been reduced to a sheer flicker. Dead situations. The children whom we have tried to raise to have high standards and high moral values have somehow grown up and have made decisions that are contrary to what we have taught them, and now they have fallen by the wayside. Yes, dead situations on, on our jobs, dead situations exist as it seems as if the more we try to do our best, the more we try to give it our all, the more it seems as if we're overlooked, we're unappreciated and underpaid and subsequently are unable to provide for ourselves or even our family. It's, it's a dead situation and, and we don't have to look that far brothers and sisters, because right here in our very own communities, it, it appears that everywhere we look, every street corner that we turn to, uh, uh, we can see things that can be considered dead situations. We see drugs, we see gun violence, we see robberies and ignorance all around us. Do, do I have a witness in here? We're, we're unable to even maintain our own neighborhoods, and, and as a result, we now have to our communities. They, they don't look like us. They don't talk like us. They don't understand us. They don't know where we come from. They don't know how we're going to get where we need to be. Some of them don't even care or like us. And, and they're moving right on in. They're, they're taking that which so many have worked hard to acquire. And, and they're building it down, tearing it down, building it back up, and calling it their own, and moving us right on out. I tell you, it's a dead situation. And, the last case of a dead situation uh, because it's a dead situation in both the literal and the metaphorical sense because uh, it shows that our young African American men continue to have their lives be valued. And unfortunately my brothers and sisters the harsh reality is that dead situations have a tendency to cause division. And instead of creating a solution to this great divide, we have become a people who continue to walk down this divided path, which ultimately leads to devastating destruction and death. I've watched over these past few weeks all of the major news stations, the CNNs and the NBCs, the CNBCs and ABCs. I've listened to the radio stations, Steve Harvey and, and Ricky Smiley. I know y'all don't listen to it, so Yolanda the Adams and, and I saw on social media, uh, Instagram and, and Twitter, Facebook, people claiming to take a stand, people talking and yet still not doing anything but adding to the divide. Uh, because as one person once put it, I cannot stand an internet activist. Uh, stop preaching about it and stand up for your rights and, and go out and support our young people uh, by going Turn it off your phone, get it off your phone, and going out into our community. 
communities because we are divided, my brothers and sisters. We're divided on the issue as to whether or why this type of attention and anger isn't made when our young boys are right here killing each other in our own backyard, right out there in Church Hill, right here in Harlem Park. We're, we're divided on the issue as to whether or not our protest should be peaceful and not violent or whether we should have our voices heard with violent force. We're, we're divided as to why this same level of passion and emotion isn't expressed during or is expressed during these moments of tragedy, uh, but isn't expressed when our communities are flooded with injustices that take place on a daily basis. When we have our young people right here being victims of crimes that are being committed against them every day. And, and I'm not just talking about crimes as it relates to shooting, but, but I'm talking about crimes such as poor educational system. I, I'm talking about crimes such as low literacy rates. I'm, I'm talking about crimes such as these young people who are dropping out of high schools at alarming rates and other systems that have been put in place in order that they may fail. But can I let you know first, African, can I reassure you, can I encourage, can I uplift and inspire you through the word of God that, that there's yet still life that exists within these dead situations? And no matter how many people have pronounced the situation as unchangeable, we still have to be willing to face these situations and uproot the little life that yet still exists within. But in our text today, Paul has just left Ephesus. He, he's left Macedonia and Greece and has been preaching and teaching the word of God. And, and now he has arrived in Troas. And while there, he starts to hold court. He starts to have a discussion. He, he has a church service, if you will, with the people there. He could not stay with them long, and so he stood and began to speak until the wee hours of the night. And, and I believe that that's a message right there in and of itself, Dr. Wallen, that, that we have to realize that we don't have much time. We, we don't have time to speak life, and so while we yet still have time, we need to make the most of our time. See, see Paul does this, and as he's speaking, we're then introduced to a young boy by the name of Eutychus. We don't know how old this brother is. We don't know where he's from. We don't know who brought him there. We just know he's a young man who is seated in a window. Yes, sir. And I don't know today if Eutychus was a junior deacon. I don't know if he was a deacon in training at someone else's church, certainly not at First African, because as the word was being brought forth, he began to fall asleep. and helps us today to realize that no matter how dead a situation may appear, uh, we still have the power to bring forth life. Uh, and this text today can be used, my brothers and sisters, as a teaching tool to help us to understand and answer the question of how do we bring life to seemingly dead situations? How do we bring life to seemingly dead situations? Well, first of all, this can happen when we continue to talk even when it seems as if we're not being heard. We have to continue talking even when it seems as if we're not being heard. Right, right there in verse 9 it says that he was seated in a window. 
and he was sinking into a deep sleep. Now, now obviously this could have been because Paul was just taking his sweet time trying to get his point across, something that I hope not to do today. Uh, it, it could have meant that he wasn't engaged enough, but it also could have meant that he felt that the topic wasn't relevant enough. But, but whatever it was, it put this young brother to sleep. But notice y'all in the text what Paul did. He continued to keep talking even when this young brother has checked out and doesn't appear to be listening any longer. And sometimes, my brothers and sisters, it appears that as we look around our world, when we look around in all of the chaos, all of the confusion, all of the calamity that exists within our world, it appears that there's nothing being done but talking. When, when we look out into the world and we see a generation that is growing up without any sign of real hope for a future, when we see black people taking their own lives, we, we see all of these things happening. And while some of it can be contributed to the fact that there's too much talking and not enough action, we still have to understand that that still doesn't excuse us or dismiss the fact that we have to keep talking. For as long as there are people who are being oppressed and suffering, we have to keep talking. As long as injustices continue to plague our nation, we have to keep talking. As long as our young girls continue to not understand their value and self-worth, we have to keep talking. As long as our young men continue to kill themselves and keep bringing down one another, we have to keep talking. Uh, for it was Winston Churchill who once said that courage is what it takes uh, to stand up and speak, but he took it a step further, Dr. Wall, uh, by saying courage is also what it takes to sit down and listen. Uh, and if we just learn how to sit down sometimes, if, if we just learn how to listen sometimes, we will see that we have a generation that is trying to tell us that they need somebody to grab them. They need somebody to hold them with a hand of love and pull them up out of this evil world. Last week, I had an opportunity to go home before school year started. Amen. Y'all pray for our educators and our students. Amen. And when I went home, I had a chance to sit down with my former daycare director. Now, you know she's influential because I've been out of daycare for quite some time. <laughs> All right? But I went ahead, and she's been very sick, and so I decided to go and visit her. And, and we went down, and we started to go down memory lane. We sat down on her porch, and we just sat there, and we talked. We talked. And uh, I asked her, Dr. Wallow, I said, how's your son doing? And she says, you know, I'm just, I'm, I'm still trying to get him right. She says, I continue to try to talk to him and talk to him and tell him to, to come to church and tell him to do better and to get his life together. She said, but something interesting happened to me a few weeks ago. I said, is that right? She said, yes. She said, I, I, I tell you, I was talking to him and, and one Sunday morning I decided to go and wake him up and tell him it's time to go to church. And when I woke him up this morning, he got up very angry. And he's a grown man, he's much bigger than I am, so I was a little nervous, but he got up angry and he said, I'm not going to church. He took it a step further by saying, why is it that you continue to go to church and, and serve that God? Have you ever seen this God before? How do you know this God is real? And I don't know about you, my brothers and sisters, but I've had moments like that in myself. I know you've been saved your whole life, but I've had moments like that where I just said, Lord, are you real? She had to step back for just a moment, and when she stepped back, she, she was just confused because she had never been presented with a question from him that she could not answer. She went on to church and she just was confused. That thing really bothered her. And, and she went ahead, pressed her way on to service, had a great service, and made her way back home. Well, when she got home and she took the key and put it in the door and unlocked the door and made her way in, she heard a moaning and a crying coming from his room. She went to his room and when she went to his room, she opened up his door and she stood right there in the doorway. And as she stood in the doorway, she saw him as he was there holding the side of his face. She said, what's, what's, what's wrong with you? Are you okay? And he said, no, mama, I'm, I'm in pain. She, she said, what's, what's wrong? He said, I have a toothache. She said, you got a, a toothache? 
He said, yes, mom, and it's hurting something terrible. She, she looked at him and she said, well, have you ever seen that toothache? <laughs> to the 
to change. Somebody say change. We have to change the social climate. We got to change the social climate. In other words, my brothers and sisters, we have to break away from the norm. We have to get away from that which makes us comfortable and that which is culturally acceptable because the fact of the matter is that we continue to do these things and guess what, y'all? It's not working. It, it, it's not working. It's not working. And if we continue to do the same thing over and over and over again and we see that it's not working and, and we continue just to talk and not change anything, through an outward expression. He graduates y'all from a place of verbal articulation to active demonstration in that he throws himself on this young man and he embraces this young man. Some translations say he put his arms around this young man. Some say that he bent over and took him in his arms. But, but the point is, my brothers and sisters, is that into an intimate position with this young man. He, he positioned himself in such a way that if it was in today's context, as some of y'all are looking at me right now, it may appear a little strange. It, it's a position that might have made a few people feel uncomfortable. It, it was in a position, y'all, that, that some would have suggested was a little too close for comfort. And, and by doing this, y'all, he demonstrates that it takes more than just Same hands lifted in that same position. 
mouth is shut. You, you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. And when you come into church, your hands being lifted up ought to be a sign of praise. They, they ought to be a sign of adoration towards God. And I'm out of here when I tell you, my brothers and sisters, that if we just got back to the gospel of the hands, I, I'm certain today that things would change. I, I'm certain today that life would be brought into some of these dead situations. If, if we just got back to the gospel of the hands, I'm not just talking about the hands that we use uh, to lift our brothers and sisters up when they're falling. I, I'm not just talking about the hands that we use uh, whenever our sisters need a helping hand, uh, but I'm talking about if we get back to the gospel of the hands, uh, those hands that will raise high and, and will stretch wide on the hill. Realize. 